Okay, everyone, uh, again, my name is Mike Goddard. I wanna welcome you to tonight's presentation on birds of lakes and marshes. And I wanna give credit to Dr. Alan Gubonic, who's the chairman of our education committee and a retired professor of ornithology from University of Nevada, Reno for all the photographs tonight. I think you're going to enjoy them. So we've got a lot of area to cover, so we'll just jump right into it here. At, at first glance, uh, Nevada doesn't seem to be very conducive to, to shorebirds, uh, considering that 90% of the state or so is in a desert. It's, this is what it looks like along Highway 50 or US 95 in most of Nevada. So do you really expect to see much in the way of water birds? But uh, where we have water, we have a variety of habitats uh, and the Carson, Truckee and Walker rivers provide water coming down out of the Sierra and they flow down into the Great Basin into Nevada. And uh, we provide riparian habitats such as this uh, Cottonwood Gallery along the uh, Truckee River. We also have deep lakes such as Pyramid Lake, which is the terminus of the Truckee River. And uh, in the background there, you can see the pyramid that the lake is named after. And the island off to the right there, the little humpy thing uh, is Anaho Island, which hosts an American white pelican nesting colony every, well, most years, not every year. So we have deep terminal lakes. We have more shallow open waters such as Washoe Lake. And we have a lot of marshes and wetlands. Uh, the Lahontan Valley's got some extensive shallow wetlands out here. So you get a variety of habitats and we have a great variety of marsh and water birds. So let's go ahead and start taking a look at these birds. We'll start out with long-legged wading birds. And the biggest, most obvious one we have is the great blue heron. Uh, the heron uh, is stands at uh, 46 inches from the tip of its bill to the end of, or to the tip of its tail. So it's a very large bird. Uh, you're not gonna miss it if it's out in your marsh. They're monomorphic, which means male and female look alike. Um, and you can see they've got those long legs, kind of a gray color with black highlights uh, here and there and a little bit of uh, rusty on them, Rufus. Uh, in flight, uh, you, they're an uh, impressive sight as from tip from the feet to the tip of the bill is four feet and from wing tip to wing tip is six feet so when these guys fly through the sky uh, they're pretty obvious they fly with very slow steady wing beats and you can't miss them they're really fun to watch uh, kind of a dark gray black with those black trailing feet and the bill out in front and on the right is a juvenile, and on the left is an adult. The juvenile lacks the white stripe on the head, and that's one way you can tell them apart. The other interesting thing about great blue herons is they nest up in trees. For such a large bird, that's rather surprising. You can see the nests on the left. There are several places out in the Lahontan Valley uh, near the Naval Air Station in the town of Stillwater and along S-Line Reservoir where you can see these great blue heron nests way up in the cottonwood trees. The next bird I'm gonna talk about is a rare visitor to our area. You um, see a lot of them over in California. And if you do see them here, it's most likely gonna be in the, in the foothills of the Sierras. They much prefer, uh, they're very secretive. They much prefer wooded streams and ponds. So we certainly don't see them if you get too far out from the hills and the mountains, uh, certainly not out here in the, in the flatlands and fallow. So next up is the black crowned night heron. It's a long legged wading bird. You can see it's got a, a pretty big head, a very short neck, and it's it's a stocky bird. It's about 24 inches in height or from tail to, to bill. Uh, as their night, as their name implies, they hunt at night. They're mostly fish eaters. And during the day, they roost up along the uh, uh, at the base of cattails and bulrush at the edge of the marsh. Uh, if there are no cattails and bulrush, you'll sometimes see these guys roosting during the day up in a tree in a, in a cottonwood or something. Here they are in flight. They can see how chunky they are. So that you see those feet trailing behind and that big black bill. Um, you're not gonna mistake them for anything else out there. And on the right is a juvenile. And you can see they're a lot different looking, much stripier. 
uh, they'll grow out of that pretty quick and start looking more like the adult. But if you see the juvenile out there, it's not a different species, it's just a, a younger bird. Uh, White-faced ibis is a bird that we get a lot of over here in Fallon. They tend to roost in the marshes at night, and then they come out into the alfalfa fields in the, in the daytime and hunt bugs with that large decurved bill. Uh, not just any alfalfa field, they prefer one that's being irrigated because as the water flows across the field, it kicks up bugs and other uh, food for these guys, or for the ibis. You can see they're, they're pretty long-legged and their feathers are actually more iridescent than black. At a distance, they look jet black. Uh, and they call them, they're called white-faced ibis and sometimes that's difficult to see. It doesn't show up as well as you might expect. Here they are in flight and you can see that white face on the bottom right there on that group that's in flight. In Fallon, it's not uncommon to see a string of 50 or more uh, ibis in a line headed out to a field, uh, kind of like, looks like geese sometimes. And uh, so we get a pretty good population of these in the summertime. Well, we're going to talk about some egrets now. We're gonna, the first one we'll start with is a great egret. It's our, it's our tallest egret, our biggest one. And as you can see, it's kind of a tall, slender, white bird with a long, long neck and gray legs. And uh, the great egrets stand about 39 inches high, just a few inches shorter than, than the great blue herons. And in flight, you can see those black legs trailing behind, that just yellow bill out front. And then the other interesting thing about the, these uh, great egrets is the bow in the neck. That is distinctive in flight. Uh, you'll see that the only bird that has that, that flies with their neck uh, bowed up like that and all white. And here they are feeding. They like, they're very, stand upright and they're very active when they're feeding, wandering around in small groups like this, uh, constantly on the move, looking out for prey. As you can see, they've got their heads down there. They're looking for anything moving in the water. And here's a comparison with the great blue heron. You can see that the great blue is just a little bit bigger, different color, and the bill's not as orange. So in a size comparison here, you can see that. So we're going to, next egret we're going to talk about is a snowy egret. It's about half the size of the great egret. It's got black legs like the great egret, but the bill is, is black. Um, and it has yellow lores up uh, in front of the eyes. And here's, here's a picture of one. You can see the yellow lores, the black, the black dagger-like bill. And then you can see lacy plumes on the back of the head and, uh, and the cur kind of curled yellow plumes at the tail. Uh, and these birds were once hunted uh, quite a bit for their feathers. But the thing that these guys are known for among birders, I say guys, these egrets are known for, is their feet, as you can see in this picture. And we refer to them as the bird with the golden slippers. So those feet stand out like crazy. So if you see these out in the field and or in the air, uh, they're pretty easy to tell apart or to tell. So check the feet and the bill, the black bill and the golden slippers, and you've got a snowy egret. Uh, here's a comparison of the size between the great egret and the snowy. You can see the snowy is about half the size. And for reference, there's a duck in the background. Can't quite make out the species, but you can uh, see that the snowy egret's quite a bit smaller than the great egret. And again, in flight, this is the great egret. You can see the orangish bill, the black legs and feet, and the bow in the neck. So if you see that in flight, that's a great egret. And the snowy egret up here in the upper left, you can see the golden feet and the black bill. Uh, it stands out quite a bit. So that's how to separate the two of those apart, to tell them apart. So which one is this? Okay, look at the feet and look at the bill. Okay, we're looking at a snowy egret. Now we have a trick question here. Is this a snowy egret or a great egret? Oh, it's a trick question. It's neither. It's actually a cattle egret. There's another, a smaller egret, a couple inches, a little bit smaller than the snowy. Uh, these 
egrets actually are considered an invading species, but they didn't get man's help to get here. They came over on one of those tropical storm depressions that flow off of the west coast of Africa to South America, and then they made their way up to Florida from there. Uh, they're called cattle egrets because they hang around with cows and pastures uh, because the cows kick up insects for them to eat. Uh, when they're in breeding plumage, you can see they have the orange bill, the black feet, uh, but in breeding plumage, they get this rufous on the head and on the back. A little bit on the breast also. So here's a comparison between the snowy egret and the cattle egret. Uh, the cattle egret's got much more yellow on it, uh, rufous on it uh, during breeding plumage than the snowy does. The snowy is just white feathered. And look at the black bill. That's a difference too, and the golden feet, of course. So here we go with one of my favorite birds. This is a bird that's more often heard than seen. It has a pretty distinctive loud call, but you hardly ever see them. That's an American bittern. and they're very good at camouflage. They've got this cryptic coloration. You can see the, uh, the uh, bold stripes they have on them, kind of the smudgy brown, and then they have up, uh, Underneath the eye, you can see a little bit of black there, black feathering on the gular area. And they're so they're, they're very cryptically colored and they move incredibly slowly through the marsh. Uh, I've seen one of these out in the, way out in the open, uh, 10 or 15 feet from any cover. And they just move agonizingly slow to cover. They don't run, they don't, they don't startle. Uh, they act almost as though you don't see them. Uh, but when they do get to cover, they kind of, you know, like I said, they slowly move to cover. And when they do get to cover, they start to assume this position and uh, start lifting up that head and turning and boop, here's looking at you. They assume the position, they become part of the marsh. Uh, the reason I like these guys, these birds so much is that uh, the Paiute uh, name for this bird roughly translates to he who sits looking at the sun or sits looking at the sun. And although the Paiute harvested a lot of birds and eggs from birds in the marsh, they did not hunt bitterns and they did not harvest eggs out of the bitter from the bittern nest because they felt like uh, this uh, bittern was most important as a guardian of the sun and they didn't want to offend him or cause anything to happen to the sun. So he was spared, the bitterns were spared hunting and egg collection by the Paiutes. So here's, uh, we're gonna move on now to some, uh, to Sandhill Crane, which is our biggest long-legged wading bird, uh, 48 inches from bill to tail. They're very active, very gregarious and noisy, very tall birds, gray colored with that red cap on them. The males are known for the display, the courtship displays that they will conduct or do with the females trying to attract a female. This male on the left here is getting ready to do that. He's starting to dance. He's going to flap his wings and tuck his head up. And uh, you can see he's got his feet up out of the water. He's leaped up into the air and he's trying to uh, convince this female that he's the bird to breed with. And uh, I'm not sure she's too interested, but he's looking pretty good there. So again, I said they're, they're noisy and gregarious. So uh, when they come into an area, you, you hear them and they hear them come in, they tend to hang out in, in flocks. Uh, areas around here where you can see them are uh, up in uh, Sierra Valley. Uh, Dr. Gubanek uh, usually leads a field trip up to Sierra Valley every year. There are some cranes that nest up there. Uh, and they like to nest in some of the inner mountain um, basins up north, like at uh, Sheldon National Wildlife Refuge. We've seen them nesting up there. Oops, sorry. Uh, now we're going to jump ahead to open water birds. Now these are birds that are going to be out in the water, not in the marsh or wading. So we'll start with uh, uh, common loon. <clears throat> A common loon is a migrat migratory bird that comes through. It's a very large, like 33 inches from, 33 inch uh, with this big, black, excuse me, dagger-like bill. 
Uh, there's a breeding plumage, a male, or a, here's a bird in breeding plumage. I shouldn't say male because they're monomorphic, but you can see they get that white checker on the back. That's distinctive. And they uh, get that white band around the neck. And they, they're big birds. They ride heavy in the water. And you can see uh, the forehead's got what looks like a little bump on it. And that's that can help you separate these out from some of the other uh, water bird, open water birds that we're going to talk about. So as I said, they're migratory. They come through. They're fish eaters. They uh, will stop at places like Walker Lake and at Pyramid Lake to fish before they move on. And uh, they'll also stop at topaz there. So they're migratory. When they go through in the spring, they have their breeding, their breeding plumage, as shown here on the left. When they come back south in the fall, they're in winter plumage. And you can see they look like a drab, duller version of themselves. Uh, the bill's not as black, and they're a lot drabber and lighter colored. But that shape, uh, the outline, the bump on the head, and the way they ride in the water is still the same. So they're they're pretty easy to pull out uh, from other species if you're out in the deep lakes. So we're going to look at a couple of or three grebes now. Uh, the first two, the western grebe and the Clark's grebe, at one time were a single species where they were both considered the western grebe, but we've split them out now. Uh, so here's a description of them. You can see the red eye, uh, no tail, very sharp bill, and that long neck. Now the other thing to note is that the eye is surrounded by black in the western grebe. On the Clark's grebe, again, it's got the long neck, the long, sharp bill, hardly any tail, and a red eye, but the eye is in the, uh, in, surrounded by white feathers. It's in the white. Um, the other thing you can look at to tell these apart is the bill color. The bill on the western is uh, more yellowish. On the, on the Clark's, it's a bit more orange. Um, and you can see the Clarks is a little bit lighter in color too, uh, but really the key characteristics to separate these two out are the location of the eye, whether it's in the white or the black, and the color of the bill. Now, the third grebe we're going to look at is a pied-billed grebe. It's a very small grebe, about 13 inches or so, and they're kind of an overall dark kind of a black with little highlights of rust or little highlights of brown on them and gray. They have the, the distinctive characteristic to note is the white bill with the black band on it. And they're monomorphic, so the speeds, sexes look alike. So this is the pied bill grebe. Like I said, it's only about 13 inches, about the size of a duck, a small duck, I should say, like a teal, perhaps. So Here's one that I expect a lot of people know, the double-crested cormorant. Uh, this is a, a breeding adult. You can see how he's called the double-crested. Those crests up there behind the eye are, are only uh, formed up there during breeding season. And the bare skin around the eyes and the bill is bright yellow. So that's a, a breeding adult. It looks like that. And uh, these guys as you, are fish eaters also. They've got kind of a fish eating looking bill. And here's the, uh, another adult in what's called the classic pose. And this adult's been swimming for a while and has gotten wet and needs to dry out. So that's why the pose, they're bathing, they're sunbathing essentially. They do have a oil, an oil gland at the base of their tail, which they will dip into with their bill and anoint their feathers with but it's, they still get wet if they're in the water for a length of time. So you'll see them out setting on, uh, on, on benches or fence posts and, and uh, boardwalks just drying themselves out. Here they are in flight. They're a pretty good sized bird. Uh, you can see the yellow around their, their bill. Uh, this is not a breeding bird because uh, it doesn't have the, the, the uh, double crests on it. The other thing that you'll note uh, in flight is the crook in the neck. They do, uh, that's distinctive of them. So uh, 
you can look for the double crests or if it's a breeding season or out of season you can look for the uh, the yellow around the bill and the and the crooked neck and next up is a very familiar bird to everybody a very common uh, year-round resident here in reno uh, geese uh, are grazers they like to eat grass so you know, that's why you see them in Reno in the traffic medians and on golf courses and on lawns is because that's where the grass is. Uh, you can see that familiar chin strap. They're kind of a gray, gray color overall with that black neck. And they're in the family Anatidae, which is the family of ducks, geese, and swans. And that family is known for having large broods. Uh, this is just a single brood here. Sometimes they'll have 12 or more, and it's not uncommon to have uh, broods, multiple broods mixed uh, after they've hatched and got down to the water. It's not unusual to see 30 or so hatchlings and chicks swimming around behind them. So if you're out looking at geese in the wintertime, look for the white geese. We get a couple species here. Uh, among those two species are the snow goose. Now this is a large goose. It's about the same size as a Canada, maybe an inch or two bigger. You can see it's all white uh, when it's setting like standing like this, and it's got the red legs and the red bill. So about the size of a Canada goose, but white. Uh, it has what we call a grinning patch on the bill, and that'll become uh, important when you look at the next white goose, which is the Ross's goose. That's the second white goose you might see out there. And it does not have a grinning patch. It looks superficially similar, except that the Ross's goose is much smaller. It's about the size of a mallard, about uh, 20 something inches. Or, and uh, it's quite a bit smaller than the Canada goose, as you can see here. But you know, if, if the bird's up in the sky at a distance, uh, you know, it's kind of difficult to judge size if there's not something close around. Um, so sometimes that, that grinning patch can help. And, and uh, okay, when they're out in flight, both the snow, snow geese and the Ross's geese will exhibit black feathers on their primaries and they'll have their necks stretched out. So if they're up in flight, you can look for that, uh, but you can't differentiate uh, just on a, uh, between those two species based on the primaries because they both have the same pattern. Okay, next up is a tundra swan. Now the, the tundra swan is our most uh, smallest and most numerous swan that we have in Nevada. Uh, as you can see, they're a, a large white bird with a long neck and they use that long neck to uh, reach down into the pond and feed in the deeper water that the ducks can't, other ducks can't reach. So it helps them uh, have a food resource that other species can't get to. And uh, there are migratory species, or wintering species here, I'm sorry. And when they come down in the winter time, they'll frequently have a young bird with them, uh, sometimes two. And the young tundra swans look this gray white color and they don't, they lack the yellow lores up, on the, up in front of the eye. Uh, in the winter time in, at Stillwater National Wildlife Refuge, it's not uncommon to have a several thousand of these tundra swans come down to spend the winter with us. And they'll come down and stay as long as the food's available, uh, meaning there is food and that they can get to it. Sometimes in the winter, uh, Stillwater and Carson Lake freeze over and these birds will head over to California and go into the rice paddies over there and some of the other ag fields. And then when it warms back up, they'll come on back over the mountain. And they'll sometimes have this uh, rusty color you can see on several of these birds out in here. And it's not a young bird or a, a, a feather or a coloration it's thing. It's, it's all about the mud. It's the dirt and the soil that they picked up in California and, and it's stained their feathers. So when they come over here, they look a little different. Uh, here they are in flight. You can see the yellow lures, that long neck, and the, the feet trailing behind. So the snow and the Ross's geese, you'll see the black on the primaries, the neck's quite a bit shorter. With the tundra swan, uh, 
there are there is no black on the on the wings and the the neck is much much longer and the yellow lore can st can stand out sometimes if the sun hits it just right the trumpeter swan is the other swan we get here the only place you can see this in Nevada is at Ruby Lake National Wildlife Refuge. The trumpeters nest up in the high mountain lakes in, in Idaho and Wyoming uh, and Montana. And they, a couple of, there's at least one pair has come down to Ruby Lake and tried to nest down there, but I don't, not sure they've been very successful there. But they're the, the biggest swan we have. They're several inches big, taller. I think they're 60 inches. Uh, they're quite a bit larger than the, than the tundras and their neck is quite a bit longer. Uh, you'll also, one thing to note is the bill uh, where it comes into the face has a point to it where with the uh, tundra swans, the bill sort of ends in the face in a squared off uh, point and the trumpeters don't have the yellow lores either. So those are characteristics to separate those out besides location. So American white pelican, uh, a very large fish-eating bird with webbed toes. Uh, they're very gregarious and, and noisy also, kind of like the, uh, like the sandhill cranes. Uh, they come up here in the summer to breed. They usually show up uh, towards the end of February and they head out to Anaho Island. Uh, their success at breeding depends almost entirely on the Kiwi run in the Truckee River. If it's a good Kiwi year, it'll be a good year for American white pelican breeding. Now on the left here, you can see these three birds have a little bump on the, on the bill. And uh, we call that a horn. It's just a little uh, protrusion that the breeding birds get that the non-breeders don't. Uh, so if you see that, you know it's a breeding bird. Uh, they, breeding birds will be nesting on Anaho Island and they will travel several hundreds of miles if they have to for food. Uh, we have recovered fish tags from the nest, nesting ground from San Francisco Bay uh, that were in the, uh, that were, where they'd caught a fish and fed it to their young on the nesting site from San Francisco Bay. It was pretty impressive. Now here they are in flight. They have that crooked neck and that big bill. Uh, and if you'll note on the wings, they show black and white, but the white extends into the secondaries closer into the body than just the primaries. So that's a good characteristic to note when you see these birds up in the sky. Uh, frequently when they leave, and a whole island to go look for fish, they'll spiral up on thermals and they'll just do wheel in these big circles, big groups of them like this. And, and then when they get up high, they'll just glide and they can glide all the way over from Pyramid Lake to, to Lahontan Valley without flapping a wing. If they get high enough, they can just glide on down. So they know how to get away with using a little bit of energy to go a long distance. And in flight, how to tell? As I said earlier, take a look at the set where the black is on the wings and look at the position of the neck. Those two things will be able to tell you whether or separate snows and Ross's geese from American white pelicans. So now we're gonna talk about some shorebirds here. The Lahontan Valley gets quite a few shorebirds here. I've just a silhouette here of some long-billed dowagers. We're gonna start out with probably the most familiar bird to most people, the, the killdeer. Uh, double breast bands are characteristic and identify that, that species. They're monomorphic uh, and they have this orange eye ring that stands out quite well. They, here they are in flight, they have that bold wing stripe and they have some rufous in the tail. You can see those double breast bands stand out pretty well in flight. And the rufous in the tail, I'm sure many of you have probably seen that when the theme, or when the bird does their uh, broken wing act to lure you away from the nest. And these guys nest out in just bare dirt, bare gravel. Uh, you'd almost, you'd step on the nest before you recognize it as a nest. It's so well camouflaged. Um, so they try to lure you away if you get close. Wilson's phalarope is a small, about nine inch uh, shore bird, very active uh, bird that we get here in the marshes. We also uh, get a group 
or migrant groups migrating through Mono Lake in the spring and the fall. They'll kind of stage up there feeding on uh, brine shrimp and black flies. Uh, I said they're about nine inches. They're very active uh, birds, constantly moving or, s or swimming around, uh, looking for. F they're just very, very active, very busy. Uh, they're interesting in that there's a role reversal between the sexes. The male is the drabber of the two. Uh, you can see here uh, the male in breeding plumage. And here's the female in breeding plumage. You can see they have a small head, kind of a long neck and that needle, uh, that dark black needle bill. Uh, this is the Wilson's phalarope. And one of the other, the two characteristics to look at on this bird are the white stripe that goes from the top of the head down the back of the neck. Uh, but even more e easier to spot uh, is that black line that goes through the eye, the supercilium there that goes through the eye and to the back of the head. So those two characteristics will help you uh, separate this phalaropes from some of the other phalaropes that are out there. Uh, when you see the phalaropes out in the water, you'll see them spinning like a whirling dervish. And they do that to create a vortex in the water column. And the vortex helps bring food items that are lower in the water up to the surface for the bird to pick up in its bill. So you'll often see them doing this spin and it just looks crazy what they're doing, but it, it's useful to them. Wilson's phalarope. Uh, American avocet, a larger long-legged wading or, or wading bird here. Uh, you, this is a male in, adult, in breeding plumage. And you can see it's got the black scapulars there on the top and then a little white below that and then the black wing. Uh, gray legs and in breeding plumage, they'll get this rusty breast and neck and head. And the sexes look very similar. There is a slight difference. Uh, they're also, uh, the avocets have this recurved bill, which they sweep back and forth just at the surface or just below the water. They sweep it back and forth side to side and, 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 and picking up food items with it. Their bills are very sensitive. As I said, there's a little bit difference here. The female on the left has a slightly more recurved bill than the male does. Uh, that's pretty much about the only difference between the two of them. But you can see the, the rusty color, the, the upcurved bill and the gray legs. And in flight, they demonstrate their, this bl bold black and white pattern on the back of their wings that is distinctive. If you see a bird in flight with that pattern, it's an avocet. In winter, they lose the breeding plumage and they become, like the loons, much drabber, uh, just a duller version of themselves when, they come, when they're migrating through. American avocets nest out here at Stillwater and Carson Lake, but some of them continue north and uh, nest in other places. But uh, even the ones that nest here will go into this molt, into this winter plumage after the breeding season. So if you're out here in the fall, this is what this avocet you're going to look like. Uh, here's a very elegant long-legged wader. This is our uh, black neck stilt. You can see he's got these long, long legs and this beautiful black and white pattern on him. And here's another picture of them. And that little white uh, patch just above the eye kind of sticks out. Makes me think of it that they're taxidermied. I'm sorry, but that little white patch makes that makes me think that. But they're very elegant birds. Very, very beautiful. Uh, the male and the female are different in that the female is uh, brown on the back. And you can see that out in the field. You can separate the two uh, sexes out uh, looking, by the, or looking at the color on the back. And here are the juveniles. You see, they get those long legs pretty early and they grow into them. But they look like little miniature versions. Okay, long-billed curlew. Now this is uh, one of our largest sand, larger sandpipers that we get here in, in Lahontan Valley. And they're characterized by that long, long bill there and uh, the cryptic coloration. 
and they prefer arid grasslands. Uh, even at Carson Lake and Pasture, you find them much more out in the pasture than you do actually in the marsh. And I was out several weeks earlier this spring and watched a group of curlews picking uh, crickets that had just recently hatched. And it was amazing that they'd stand there and the cricket would look like it was way out of reach. It would be look like two or three feet away and just the bird just kind of like boop flips its bill and grabs it uh, i don't think the cricket even saw it coming so it's amazing what they can do with that long bill and they nest here in carson lake uh, in the in the pastures they also nest uh, up in some of the inner mountain uh, basins such as the reese river valley up uh, north of ruby lake at franklin uh, uh, franklin uh, wildlife management area there in the Ruby Valley. They nest up there. Um, and like I said, you'll find them out in the pasture and they're cryptically colored. So you just kind of have to keep an eye out for movement. And they're pretty active feeders. So you'll see them if they're out there moving around. Just keep your eyes out. Uh, next up is our greater yellow legs. It's a, a slender, tall, slender bird with yellow legs and that black upturned or slightly upturned bill. Uh, they're very common here, as you, uh, the greater yellow legs. And here's a, you can see that upturned bill, that white, that white belly and the, and the yellow legs. Uh, and I see what the height is on these. I, I think they're about, I want to say 14 inches or so on these guys. Let me see. Yeah, 14 inches, and they're very active. You'll see there, see them out in the marsh being hunting like this. And the bill is much longer than the head. You can see the yellow legs there. How they get the why they have that name or how they get it. And they're pretty common out here. Uh, sometimes they're a little hard to, to separate. You get it takes a little practice to get used to them or to be separating them out from some of the other birds. For example, this bird here at first uh, can sometimes look like yellow legs, but it's not. It's actually a willet. And uh, it's a large, heavy set wader. You can see that bill, it looks quite a bit different than the yellow legs. And the legs are different, a different color also. You often see willets out by themselves, singly walking the shore, uh, looking for food, hunting and pecking along the shoreline. In flight, they have a very distinctive wing pattern. It's sh shown here. That shows up even more when they start to settle in. So if you see that pattern, you've got a willet. Uh, and that's a pretty, very pretty sight. So here are the two, the willet versus the greater yellow legs for comparison. Next up is a long-billed dowager. These, this is a very common bird here, probably one of the most numerous birds that we get in the Lahontan Valley. Uh, kind of a small, or small stocky bird with that long bill. And they feed, when they're feeding, they probe in the mud with that bill, just up and almost straight up and down, just like a sewing machine. Uh, so, they're pretty distinctive when they're feeding. You can see the, the feathers, this black scapulars there, they have on the top kind of a white or a, a rufous bar and black with a white tip on the feathers. It kind of gives them that scalloped appearance. And then the belly is, in breeding is washed with, with uh, the cinnamon or color underneath there or the orangish color, it's more orange than cinnamon. And that long bill, that's stands out pretty well. Now here they are in flight. You can see that uh, if you look, you can see some of the orange belly on some of them. You can see that bill sticking out. And then uh, it looks like they have some white up under the wings there that, uh, that shows up you know, when they're in flight. Here they are coming into land. Again, look at the bills. You can see the bills. You can see kind of that wash on them. And this is a flock. Some of the flocks are you know, 50 or 100. Some of them uh, get flocks of 2,000 or more, 2,500 of these, guys, uh, of these uh, dowagers out in the marsh during uh, spring migration. You can see some avocets there in the foreground. 
Uh, and then here they are landed and feeding and they tend uh, to hang out close together and all feed in the same area and kind of move together. So you can see some avocets some black neck stilts out there. Uh, what else we got? Uh, that's about it for right now. So that's the long billed dowager. And here they are in winter plumage. Again, just a drabber version of themselves. Uh, the silhouette's the same, the bill is the same, it's just the color is different. So we're gonna go to the snowy plover. Uh, this is a, a uncommon bird that likes salt pans and dry mud flats. Uh, not the kind of habitat you would usually associate with a plover. I don't know if any of you are familiar with Sand Mountain, but on the way to Sand Mountain east of Fallon, there's a salt flat out there that gets a skim of water, and that's one of the preferred habitats of these guys. They're called a belted plover because you can see what we call the belt there. It looks more like their shoulders. There's two little black marks that come down towards the breast. They don't join, but we call that a belt. And they have that little plover bill. The plovers all have these little small dark bills. Uh, the snowy plovers also, if you see them at a distance, they stand very front heavy. They look front heavy, like they might tip over. And you can see that belt on them. And the males in breeding get a black, uh, black forehead there. And here's one of the chicks that they've brought, that this uh, bird's brought off out, out in, the, in the salt pan, in the marsh. And here's another picture of a cute little bird. So saying goodbye to all, for all the plovers. So we're gonna jump into, in the last section here, we're gonna jump into some ducks, uh, at least 15 species that we get in the area. So we'll just kind of move through some of these uh, quickly. So ducks are divided into two big groups, dabbling ducks like the mallard shown here, feed by what we call tipping up. They can't dive under the water. So they, the only way they can reach the vegetation they feed on is to tip up like this and, and stick their heads in the water and dabble and pull up the vegetation and feed on it. The other difference you'll note with dabbling versus diving ducks is when a dabbling duck like a mallard wants to leave the pond, they can just leap right up out of the water and start flying. Uh, with a diver duck, um, such as a redhead or a canvas back, they have to run across the surface of the water on their feet to kind of get going. They can flap their wings and run across and then they can gain, gain height and start flying. They can't just sleep out of the water like the dabblers do. So we're gonna start with a mallard. And although people call them green heads, uh, they're actually more iridescent than you might think. And all ducks are dimorphic. The males and the females look quite different. And the females generally are much drabber because they're the ones that have to sit on the nest and protect the eggs from predators. Um, so we've got a mallard here and male and female. Uh, you can see the mallard is also male, is known for having these curved rectrices, tail feathers on the bird. And you can see from the head here, it's no longer looking green, it's looking more blue, purple. So the feathers are actually iridescent. And the mallard, if you'll note, has a uh, red breast and a white belly. Uh, and here, here's a, another picture of an adult breeding male with that white ring around his neck, uh, the typical green head picture that you'd see. Uh, now there's another duck out there that looks similar to a mallard and can be confused at a distance. And that's the, there's some here, that's the northern shoveler. You can see a group of them here, male and female. And you can see they look very, almost exactly the same, except the breast is white and the belly is red. It's a reverse of the, of the mallard. And look at that bill. That's how they get their name, uh, northern shoveler. Uh, but they look superficially like a mallard. And there's an old story that uh, if a hunter accidentally shot a northern shoveler, and uh, he didn't want to eat it because everybody thinks they taste like mud because they like really shallow, shallow, shallow water. Um, so if you accidentally shoot a shoveler, you take it, take it home and you give it to your neighbor and you tell them it's a mallard. So that's like one of the old uh, saws about duck hunting. Thought I'd pass that along. <laughs> uh, here they are in flight. 
that white wing, under wing uh, really stands out against the red belly of, of the shoveler. And so that, yeah, that's how to tell them in flight. And here's a male and a female. The female's in the front and the male's in the back, but it looks like that male is going through a molt, probably a post-breeding molt. Uh, he's starting to lose some of the red on the, he's either going in or coming out of molt. It's hard to tell just from the picture, but that's a male and a female shoveler, typical look that you'd see out in the field. Okay, so mallard and shoveler, you can compare them. You see the difference in the coloration and the pattern. We're gonna talk about the gadwall next. Uh, this is a very interesting little bird, a very colorful male up there on the top. Very thin bill, they ride high on the water. And down in the lower right, uh, you can see the wing pattern on the speculum. Uh, the secondaries uh, on, on ducks, uh, are unique to the species and the pattern of colors you see in flight can tell you what species you're looking at. So again, here, here's the gadwall and uh, very fine vermiculations on the feathers, very thin bill, rounded head, and they uh, float high on the water. And the other characteristic to look at is that black butt that sticks out at a distance when they're riding on the water. And again, they're, they're dabblers also. You can see that black butt sticking up as they try to feed or as they feed. And in flight, if you see a duck in flight that shows black and white on the secondaries and brown on the body, that is a gadwall. There's no other bird that has those three colors on it uh, uh, in flight. So if you see those colors, you're looking at a gadwall. Oh, next up, northern pintail, sometimes called the greyhound of ducks. Very elegant bird, very long neck. Um, I love that, that black and white or brown and white pattern on the neck. Uh, their pintail gets uh, aptly named because of the long tail that it has. Here they are in flight. Uh, you can see that long tail sticks out, and you can see on the secondaries on pintails, if you see the brown, the black, and the white in that pattern, that is a pintail. Uh, actually, that's not uh, black. It's more of a green. It's just the color's not showing up too well here. So if you see that color on, on a bird in flight, that's a pintail. But, you know, the tail and the head are going to tell you what it is uh, anyway. Uh, and the female is, looks a little bit drabber, but the wing pattern is the same, the coloration on the wing. Uh, American widgeon uh, used to be called a bald pate, uh, where pate refers to head and bald refers to white, such as like the bald eagle is uh, got a white head, so they call it uh, bald. Um, so you can see that white stripe and the green stripe on the side are characteristic of the American widgeons. Uh, also, you'll see that black and white butt, uh, that'll show up at a distance too. If you see the bird uh, in, facing away from you or where you can't see the head or the white stripe, look for that black and white butt. <laughs> Here's the female. Um, the bill is kind of blue with a black edging on it. And here again, male and female together, you can see that black and white tail pattern on the male. And here you can get a good picture, a good view of the white stripe and the, over the top of the head. And the green eye stripe isn't showing up quite so well in this picture, but that will also stand out quite well in bright light. We look at green wing teal, we get uh, two species of teal are common in here. Green wing is probably the uh, one of them, or the more common of them. And teal are very small. They're about half the size of a mallard duck, maybe a little bit bigger than that. They're about 13 or 14 inches on, uh, on the teal. And you can see the mallard in the background here in comparison, it looks like a PT boat and a destroyer. Uh, but that green head stripe and that white vertical slash are the things to look for and the size with the teal. You can also see that white vertical slash and under the tail, there's a little bit of yellow you can see sometimes. Uh, but the size and, and, and the slash are in, uh, usually in the green eye stripe are 
characteristic of, of green winged teal. The other, here is a close up of the male, uh, the green eye stripe and the, the little bit of yellow there and, the, and that white slash that stands out. So this is a breeding male. And here's, an, here's a pair. So remember, these are very small. They'll, they'll, they'll stand out by themselves. The other teal we have is a cinnamon seal here, that bright red eye on the male. And they just are, stand out like you wouldn't believe with the blue on the wings. When they fly, the forewing will have a big blue pattern on it. Uh, and they're just as cinnamon as can be. And again, they're about the same size as the, or as the uh, green wing teal. They're rather small. So now we're gonna take a look at some diver ducks. First up is the ring neck and that bill pattern, that white uh, lining uh, edging of the bill is distinctive. The head shape, it seems, it looks almost pointed. It's not quite, it's rounded, but uh, that's characteristic of the ring neck. Uh, they're called ring neck because they do have a brown ring at the base of the neck like the mallard has a white one, but it just doesn't show up very well at all at a distance. Perhaps the most uh, telling, easily identifiable characteristic is what we call that the spur, that white uh, triangle that pokes up on the breast there. We call that a spur and that is characteristic. If they, you see that, you've got a ring neck. So here they are, you can get a better look at the head shape. And that, that, that's uh, different from most ducks. And you can see that uh, the spur sticking up on the males. And then the, the blue, the bill pattern is, is distinctive also. And again, these are, these are divers. So they dive under the water and swim through the water after their food. They're vegeta they eat veget vegetative matter, just like the other ducks, but they will dive for it and swim. And so it allows them to utilize resources that the dabblers can't get to. Oh, this is what this is one duck that's uh, we get a lot of out here, the ruddy duck. The males are just so cool. Uh, they have a big attitude. Uh, you can see that bright blue bill and that just rusty red color and the black head uh, is is unique. They, they belong to a subfamily of ducks called the oxyurinae, which means or we call them the stiff-tailed ducks because they always hold their tail uh, up in this uh, stiff position like that. And the males get very aggressive with one another uh, during breeding season. Uh, they'll be chasing each other around, fighting, and they will get quite active trying to attract a female. They'll go up and bob or bob their heads and do all sorts of displays. Here's a close-up of them. Uh, they just look like, they're just small, they're pretty small birds, but they just look like they have tons of attitude out in the field. They're, they're kind of interesting, <laughs> uh, kind of pugnacious, I guess is what I'm saying. And here in winter plumage, again, they get very drab uh, when they come back down during the fall migration or if they stay here in the winter or through the fall before they migrate. And here's a female, looks very similar. The, the, the face pattern is a little bit different, but uh, I don't think you'll have any trouble uh, fi uh, identifying these uh, females or the males in winter plumage out there. Uh, Bufflehead is our smallest duck. It is known, uh, called a bufflehead because of that white patch on the back of the head. It's a very small bird, about 13 and a half inches, it's our smallest duck. Uh, the male shows this uh, distinctive black and white pattern on its back when it's, when it's either flying or as in here, it's getting ready to do a display to a female. Uh, and that white head that stands out a long way away. Buffalo heads are very easy to spot, even as small as they are, because that head just sticks out like crazy. And here's the female. She's got the little white wing pat or cheek patch. Uh, the only bird you might confuse this with would be the female ruddy, but uh, the ruddy uh, female doesn't have a distinct patch like it's this. It has a little bit of white, but uh, not that, not, not a patch. So, and again, the feathers are actually iridescent on the males, as you can see here. 
Uh, we're going to look at some mergansers here. The first one is a common merganser. This is a fish eating bird, rather large, 30 something inches long with that saw bill. You can see the shape of the bill and the color uh, is very distinctive. Uh, they prefer rivers and deep lakes. You're more likely to see uh, common mergansers out on the Truckee River than you are in the marsh. Now here they have a pretty distinctive pattern on their back when they're uh, getting ready to display or fly. And uh, like the other birds that have iridescent feathers, at a distance they can look black, uh, and then when you're up close, they're they're uh, numerous colors. And here's the female. She has the same saw bill that the male has, but she has quite the dew there, kind of a brown head, and and all the females look like this. It's not just a bad hair day. So here's another picture of the common merganser, male and female. So you can see see the two sexes. And again, the, the mergansers are pretty good sized birds and uh, they, they can tend to swim low in, on the water too sometimes. The other, one of the other mergansers we get is a hooded merganser and here's a male and a female. Uh, they're a bit smaller, quite a bit smaller than, than the uh, 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 the other, uh, the hooded, or, I'm sorry, than the common merganser. Uh, and they're known, the males anyway, for having this hammerhead crest. Uh, you can see that white patch on there. And the females look quite a bit like the, the, uh, the common mergansers. They have that bill and the, brand, the hair that sticks up all spiky. And the male also has, uh, I'm sorry, on the left, you can see those two black uh, bars coming down on the breast and the white, and those are called spurs. So you'll see those spurs on the hooded mergansers. And here they are. This is a male getting ready to, or doing a display. You can see that crest can be raised or lowered uh, depending on what they're doing, whether they want to attract a female, intimidate a, 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 a competing suitor, uh, or whether they're just relaxing, they can put that in different positions. So here you can see the one on the, in the middle has got the crest lowered, the one on the left, the male on the left has got his crest raised up a little bit. And you can see the female uh, following with them. Okay, we're getting close to the end here. We got American Coot. Uh, Felica americana, one of the favorite birds of the Paiute, uh, it was a bird that they used to feed on and hunt uh, quite heavily, but there are scads of coots here. Uh, they're very common, abundant, and you can tell them uh, by that white blackbird with a white bill that stands out. And they're very ungainly on land. You can see they have lobed feet. Little red eye there. And like I said, they're very ungainly on land. Here's one standing on one leg and now he's decided he's gonna move somewhere. So he's getting ready to, to get it going here. And here we go, he's got that other leg out. Now he's moving along there. You know, some of these, some birds, for example, the, uh, the Clarks and the Western Greaves that we looked at earlier, their legs are set so far back on the body that they can't, cannot walk on land. So we're gonna finish up with uh, two goals. The ring-billed goal here, very common and characterized by that ring on the bill. Uh, goals go through a lot of plumage changes. So if you see that black on the bill, that's, that's the ring-billed. The other one we get is a California gull, and it's got these red, uh, red spot, or uh, red dots, and uh, red spots and black dots on the bill, and the dark eye. So that's the the California gull. And with that, uh, we're finished with the program. I thank you very much for for attending tonight, and I hope you learn some interesting information. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. Uh... Um, I do this. Our, uh, uh, oh, do you need help getting out? Uh, no, here we go. Okay. okay. 
Ah, um, someone says, uh, great presentation, Mike. So, uh, okay. yeah, I think that's what everybody has to agree. So now we have time for questions. So if anybody has uh, questions, feel free to submit them with the Q&A button on Zoom. Or uh, if you're watching on Facebook, feel free to uh, comment on our Facebook uh, live stream right now. And... Uh, Another person said, fabulous presentation. Thank you. Well, uh, while we're waiting for someone to submit a question, uh, I have a, uh, um, ah, oh, here is one. Uh, are wood ducks common in our area, Mike? Uh, we have what a wood duck project that's been going on for a number of years. Uh, in the Fallon area, along the uh, the Carson River, uh, after it flows below the uh, diversion dam, uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service actually uh, Ducks Unlimited came in and they started. Uh, no, I'm sorry, Chris Nikolai, a graduate student at UNR, started a program here a number of years ago, putting nest boxes up on private lands along the river. And he's managed to uh, create a lot of good nesting habitat and have really picked up the, the wood duck population here in Fallon. So if you wanna see wood ducks come down to the uh, Carson River below Diversion Dam in Fallon uh, and they're quite a few of them here. I'm not that familiar with how, how uh, common they are up in the Reno area. That might be a question for Alan. Mm -hmm. We have another question, Mike. Uh, are you still taking volunteers for the Carson Stillwater uh, bird count? Uh, we are. We're putting the training together at this moment, and we anticipate doing some uh, some surveys uh, this this summer uh, in August and maybe early September. So if you're interested, uh, contact myself, uh, Mike Goddard at Nevada, uh, Mike.Goddard at NevadaAudubon.org or Alan.Gubonic at NevadaAudubon.org. We're still looking for volunteers. Well, we'd happy to have some more. <laughs> I see. Uh, well, uh, I have a question myself, and uh, that is, uh, what's a good place to see uh, um, uh, the um, gloons that you were talking about, which migrate through during the spring and fall? I'm sorry, the what? The, uh, the common loons. Okay, Pyramid Lake is going to be your best bet. Pyramid or Topaz Lake. Uh, Walker Lake used to have quite a few, but the fish uh, down there are, the fish resource is pretty much diminished because of the high salinities. Uh, so Pyramid Lake or Topaz would be your best bet. Ah, and, uh, someone else said, thank you, Mike, uh, for your presentation. Anyways, well, I think that's uh, good enough now. Uh, once again, uh, everyone here, thank you so much, Mike, uh, for uh, stepping up and presenting your knowledge all about the Martian water birds of Northern Nevada. We are all- All right, thank you, everyone. To, uh, everyone for uh, tuning in and joining us on this presentation. It was our last uh, presentation in our Birds of Truckee Meadow series. Everybody, we wish you all the best and have a great summer.